I mentioned in one of our Sunday school that I saw a powerful documentary about an autistic boy who lost all hopes of interacting meaningfully with the world until he discovered Disney animated movies. The title, by the way, of the documentary is uh, Life Animated. So meaning through popular Disney storage, uh, stories, he managed to be functional by looking at the world in terms of the most prominent themes that are spread through, throughout those uh, Disney stories. But soon, he learned that life is more complicated than Disney stories. Uh, nevertheless, it tells us of the power of stories in order to uh, orient the way we live, the way uh, of uh, our life. Uh, by God's grace, brethren, we are given the true story of the world. And we have that in the great drama of redemption centered on the Lord Jesus Christ. And it is our call, therefore, to see our place in that story, to see how we inhabit that story, and so we may be able to live out uh, that uh, identity as people of the gospel story. And Nehemiah, I believe, is an example of one who embraced his place in this story of God's redemption. So we return to the book of Nehemiah today and continue to, uh, to look at the lessons uh, in order to help us uh, to be able to live our Christian lives. So I invite you to open to the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah chapter 2. We will be reading from verse 1 to verse 8. Nehemiah chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. I will read, In the month of Nisan, in the twentieth year of King Artaxerxes, when wine was before him, I took up the wine and gave it to the king. Now I had not, I had not been sad in his presence. And the king said to me, why is your face sad, seeing you are not sick? This is nothing but sadness of the heart. Then I was very much afraid. I said to the king, Let the king live forever. Why should not my face be sad when the city, the place of my father's graves, lies in ruins and its gates have been destroyed by fire? Then the king said to me, What are you requesting? So I prayed to the God of heaven. And I said to the king, If it pleases the king, and if your servant has found favor in your sight, that you may send me to Judah, to the city of my father's graves, that I may rebuild it. And the king said to me, the queen sitting beside him, How long will you be gone, and when will you return? So it pleased the king to send me when I had given him a time. And I said to the king, if it pleases the king, let letters be given me to the governors of the province beyond the river that they may let me pass through until I come to Judah. And a letter to Asaph, the keeper of the king's forest, that he may give me timber to make beams for the gates of the fortress of the temple and for the wall of the city and for the house that I shall occupy. And the king granted me what I asked. For the good hand of my God was upon me. So this is the word of God. Uh, in the last chapter, we were introduced to the major conflict that will play out in the book of Nehemiah's narrative. And uh, wh what we have learned is that it was a conflict about the situation of the city of Jerusalem. Its gates and its uh, walls had been destroyed and torn down. And while in Susa, Nehemiah received this depressing report that his people, the Jewish people, are, are actually in a vulnerable situation because of this exposed status of Jerusalem. Their defensive walls and their gates, their opening, uh, has all been uh, de destroyed and now they are vulnerable to the attacks of their enemies and that is what we have read in chapter 1 verse 3 and they said to me the remnant there in the province who had survived the exile is in great trouble and shame the wall of jerusalem is broken down and its gates are destroyed by 
uh, fire. So they are exposed to the attacks of their enemies and they are surrounded by people who are intent uh, to uh, ruin their city and to annihilate their population. But in spite of Nehemiah's secure and comfortable position in the exalted Persian city of Susa, Susa being the capital of this Persian empire, when Nehemiah heard the news about uh, his people, about his city, uh, it became an intolerable agony in his heart. It was something that really brought pain and depression in his heart. And this actually reveals Nehemiah's heart that in spite of his good and comfortable and secure position in, in Susa, Nehemiah's heart was actually in Jerusalem. In other words, uh, above all, he identifies with the people of God rather than with the pagan people of the Persians. That he identifies with Jerusalem, the city of God, rather than the pagan city of, uh, of uh, Susa. And he identifies with Yahweh, uh, chief of all, rather than the gods of the Persians and even uh, Artaxerxes the king. So that was the heart of Nehemiah. And Nehemiah's prayer, as we have studied in uh, last Sunday in chapter 1, his prayer actually revealed his conviction that the one true sovereign God is not done with his people. He was burdened, and yet he believed that his God, the God of the Jewish people, the one true sovereign God is still not done with his people. He still has a plan that is ongoing because he has made a covenant with his people and therefore uh, this is something that brought Nehemiah to his knees in order to pray to his God. The story of redemption in Nehemiah's mind is still ongoing and although they were exiled uh, to a foreign land from their native land, Nehemiah was convinced that it was just an interim and that God is going to resume his plan and that the story of redemption is going to come to an end. Therefore, Nehemiah believed that God is coming to the rescue. He is going to rescue his people. And so the effects of that in Nehemiah is that he saw his place, his providential situation as a cupbearer to the king, his placement in the world. He saw that as, as something that he must give at the disposal of his God, that it is something that he was placed as, a, as his situation in the world in order to advance not his own cause, but the cause of his God. And there is a near precedent of this uh, to Nehemiah, uh, this, uh, this kind of resolute de devotion to the cause of God is something that we also see uh, uh, earlier uh, preceding Nehemiah, and that is in the book of Esther, which we have read earlier. Uh, in the book of Esther, we find that the people of God are also facing a, tra a potential tragedy and it is a tragedy of the possible annihilation of the Jewish people because of the plot of Haman. And he has secured a decree from the king in order to annihilate the Jews, in order to, to usher in uh, some kind of a holocaust of his time. And it was a crisis for the people of God. And the question then that the people, that the, the Jewish people were asking, facing this trouble, is that is there going to be a deliverance for the Jews? Or perhaps this is the end for the Old Testament people of God. And Mordecai's words to Esther is very insightful. Mordecai in chapter 4 verse 14 of the book of Esther told the queen, he, he spoke these words, if you keep silent at this time, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another place. 
In other words, Mordecai was convinced that this is not the end of the Jewish people, that they are, they are facing this crisis. They do not know yet where, where the deliverance may come, but he is sure that there is going to be a deliverance because God is not done with His people. God is not done with the story of redemption. And He has made a covenant. He has given promises that relates to salvation, that relates to redemption. And God cannot just throw this away. So although He is still blind as to where this, uh, this uh, redemption is going to come, uh, nevertheless, He is convinced that it's coming. Because God is sovereign and His story is ongoing. The story of redemption is something that is still coming into conclusion. And yet, how did Mordecai challenge Esther? Uh, he, he told Esther that if you keep silent at this, at this time, there will still be a deliverance. But she asked Esther this question, Who knows? whether you have not come to the kingdom for such a time as this. In other words, he was telling Esther that perhaps the very reason that you are situated in that privileged position of being the primary queen of the Persian Empire with a direct access to the king, to, to, the, the, to the Persian king Ahasuerus, perhaps it is precisely for the purposes of God. It's not for you. It is not a Cinderella, Cinderella story where you just came from rags to riches. Uh, now you are a beautiful queen uh, in the Persian Empire. Perhaps the purpose of that is so that you may make use of it in order to advance the cause of God, in order to serve the protection of God's people. That was what Mordecai was telling Esther, God does not need you. He has his story and it's going to continue with, with or without you. But perhaps you are being invited to play a part and it is a privilege that you must wholly embrace to serve God and to serve His purposes. And that is something that we must keep in mind as well, brethren. God is sovereign. We know that. And He will see His purposes into completion. What He has started, He will bring to, to, to its conclusion. And yet, by His grace, we are being invited, brethren, to play a part. To play a part in this great drama of redemption to see our providential situations in the world as indeed part of this grand story. That is why I started with that introduction. We have the, this grand story of redemption and we are being invited to live out our lives. We are being called, in fact, as Christians to live our life for the service of this story, to act it out in our own individual placements in the world. And Esther embraced that call. Esther embraced the cause of God when she braved the throne of Ahasuerus, the Persian king, with an unflinching resolve, if I perish, I perish. I'm going to do this for the people of God. And the same is what Nehemiah did in our chapter here in chapter 2. And the same call is being issued to you, dear brothers and sisters in Christ. And what we can take from here then is this. As a message, times of crisis calls for men and women who will wholly give themselves to the cause of God. Itong mga panahon ng krisis ay tumatawag sa mga lalaki at mga babae ng Panginoon na ibibigay ang kanilang mga sarili para sa layunin ng Diyos. Times of crisis calls for men and women who will devote themselves wholly to the cause of God. 
These are the men and women, brethren, who would not excuse their indifference to the cause of God, their coldness to the cause of God by a shameless appeal to God is sovereign anyway. He does not need me. He can do what He wants. Therefore, I can just rest my hands and stay in my comforts and security. These are not the people who become useful in the kingdom of God. It is those who would instead bear the burden, embrace the grief even, the anguish, those who would weep, and those who would pray in despair and act in order to vindicate the glory of God. So they would rather see their situatedness in, their, in the world, whether their privileges perhaps or their disadvantages, not as something that only serves their individual story or their individual purposes, but the story of God and His glory. So where do you stand, brethren? In our passage, we find two more traits that we could add to what we have studied last Sunday. Two more traits that we need to cultivate as we seek to be men and women who would wholly embrace the cause of God and, we, and would be useful for, for the purposes of God's kingdom. And we find this in Nehemiah. And the first of that is patience in waiting. Second, we find in Nehemiah, wisdom in action. So these are the two matters that we must aspire to as we seek to wholly embrace the cause of God. Patience in waiting and wisdom in action. So let us look at the first one. Patience in waiting. Now, in, in the first chapter, we are told that the news of Jerusalem's unfortunate state that the walls had been torn down and that the gates are flung open and had been destroyed by fire. This is the state of Jerusalem. This news came to Nehemiah in the month of Kislev. Uh, so that is a month in the Jewish calendar. But when we come to the events of chapter 2, we find that it is now set in the month of Nisan. So you read, you read in chapter 2, in the month of Nisan, in the same year, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, so meaning the setting of chapter 2 is the month of Nisan while uh, the news of Jerusalem's uh, state actually uh, came to Nehemiah in the month of Kislev. Now these are four months apart from the month of Kislev. Where Nehemiah, when, when Nehemiah heard the unfortunate, unfortunate news of the state of Jerusalem towards the month of Nisan, where we find the events, events of chapter 2, when something is now going to be done about that state, these months are separated by four months. That means Nehemiah actually was not able to do anything about his heavy burden for Jerusalem in those matter of months. And that means his grief, his anguish, his anxiety for what's happening for his people was something that was only growing as he was continually being confronted by the sad news of what's happening in Jerusalem, their uncertain future and their unabated crisis. And that was what's happening to Nehemiah. Now, you, sometimes you read your Bible and you read the first chapter, then you jump to the second chapter and you think that uh, from the first chapter to the second chapter, it happened only in just a matter of days. And that is, not, that is a wrong way of doing it. That means chapter 1 and chapter 2 are separated by months. In the case of Nehemiah, it was a painful, agonizing months of weeping and worrying and crying and being in despair for the situation of Jerusalem. But, that is, but those periods of times 
are times when God is actually preparing His men and women to become useful for the kingdom of God. So what we can learn from that is that the character of the man or woman who would be used by God is actually forged in the furnace of waiting. So that is how God prepares His people for His great work. Now, waiting is actually a prominent theme in the Bible, especially in the Old Testament, but not any less true when you come to the New Testament. Waiting, uh, when, uh, especially in the Old Testament, is that time when God's people are actually holding tightly unto their hope in God. They are, they are grasping God, so to speak, in order to maintain themselves in a disposition of hope. Because it is these times, during those periods of times, when His restoration and His deliverance apparently delay. When they are waiting for deliverance, they are waiting to be restored, and yet there seems to be a delay there seems to be an unnecessarily prolonging of their dire and pitiful condition. And yet the people of God is still holding on to their hope that God is coming to the rescue, that God has not abandoned us. That's called waiting in the Bible. So you are probably familiar with that great uh, passage in Isaiah 40 verse 31 where the Lord promises through the prophet Isaiah, that those who wait upon the Lord shall renew their strength and they shall rise up with wings like eagle. Uh, so this is what is meant by waiting. It is during those times when God seems to be absent, when God seems to be giving frowning providence, when the bud tastes bitter, and yet you still hope and you still hold on to the truth that behind the frowning providence, He hides a smiling face. And that the bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. So that is waiting in Scripture. But lest we mistake it, waiting in this sense is not actually a passive activity. Uh, it's not as if we're waiting and we're doing nothing. In Hebrew, waiting is associated with the word braiding, binubuhol. So waiting upon the Lord means holding unto Him, means we braid ourselves in faith to Him, meaning it is active. It is actually an action, an act of sustained faith even in trying times. And sometimes that's where God is putting us. And perhaps it is this kind of times when we had been crying out to the Lord in order to restore us to the normal state of affairs for our church where we can gather together again without the fear of this virus transmitting to every one of us. And... And yet, our response must be to hold on to God, to believe that He is doing something that would prove to be for the good of His people. It is, wait, waiting is God's call to His people when they are placed in a state of crisis, and yet there is no clear move. There is no clear what's next. And we have that both in our lives as a church and perhaps our individual lives also. And you may be having that perhaps this afternoon where you are stuck in a situation and you do not know yet what the Lord is going to do and to call you to act upon. You are being called to wait upon the Lord. Now, what is the preoccupation of God's people during these periods? Well, we can only assume that Nehemiah 
sustained his prayer and fasting regularly during those periods of four months. So when we read in chapter 1, verse 4, that as soon as I heard this, as soon as Nehemiah heard these words, he said, I sat down and wept and mourned for days, and I continued fasting and praying before the God of heaven. Meaning for four months that he was in this situation, he was praying. He was storming the mercy seat of God in order to lead the way as to where as to where he is leading him and his people. So meaning the preoccupation of God's people during these times is to be real, desperate praying. These are times that we are being invited to storm the mercy seat with our lamentations before God and with our plea until God has given us the means to be restored. In Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 62, there is that beautiful passage of the Lord's promise to His people through the prophet Isaiah that He will see to it that one day, Jerusalem and its temple and its people are going to be exalted as the chief city all over the earth that it's going to be rebuilt. And when it is rebuilt, it is going to be the very center of salvation for all the nations. The Lord said in that chapter, For Zion's sake, Zion is Jerusalem, For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. This is God who is speaking here. And for Jerusalem's sake, I will not be quiet. This is God's heart for His city. He's going to be rebuild it. He's going to rebuild it. He's going to even cry out, he con continue being in anguish in some sense until it is rebuilt. That is Isaiah 62 in the first verses. So he promises that to his people, one day Jeru you will see Jerusalem exalted among the nations. And yet he fulfills this we are told in that same chapter by the means of praying people. Isaiah 62 verse 6, the Lord said, On your wall, O Jerusalem, I have set watchmen all the day and all the night. They shall never be silent. So God is not silent for the sake of Jerusalem. And He has appointed watchmen on the walls of Jerusalem to also not be silent, to keep crying out to keep storming the mercy seat. For what? You who put the Lord in remembrance, take no rest and give Him no rest until He establishes Jerusalem and makes its praise in the earth. So this is God's call to His people. Become watchmen who would, who would cry out for the sake of my city, Jerusalem who would not be silent with me, who will take no rest, but weep and pray and cry in despair until he has established his purposes for Jerusalem. And that is what I believe Nehemiah was doing in that period of four months. He was praying to God. He was, he was a watchman to God. And he was storming the mercy seat in order to have the walls of Jerusalem rebuilt and so that the city of Jerusalem, which has become associated with God, shall be restored. Now, why does the Lord do this? Why did He do this in Nehemiah? And why is He doing that perhaps to you, to me, to us? You know, there are displays of zeal for the work of the Lord that proved to be fleeting. Panandalian lang. One moment, a man is ready to do the Lord's work and even die doing the Lord's work. And yet at another, all passion is dead. It has been dulled by comforts, 
and security. But Nehemiah's anguish, which we have learned as soon as he heard the news about Jerusalem, he cried out for Jerusalem. He wept. His heart is for the glory of God. His heart is for the purity of His worship. And His heart is for the deliverance of His people. But, we, but it proved to be not a fleeting matter. It was not a quick rush of sentimentalism on Nehemiah's part. He was in anguish and in prayer in those matter of four months. And that is the challenge to us as well. You know those incubation, uh, the process of in incubation is when you have a weak infant, for example, who, who, may be, who may be in peril of losing its life, so you place it in a, an incubation in order to be kept heated so that it will not lose its life. It will continue to hold on to life. Well, we, ha we need to do that kind of incubation as well. We need to incubate our hearts. We need to incubate our affections, our holy affections, so that we may not grow cold, especially during trying times. And the incubation place for us, brethren, is the shelter of prayer. It is in prayer that we stir up those holy affections so that we may hold on to God and His promises. So I challenge you to wait upon the Lord, brethren, during this crisis and to sustain your affections for God and for the things of God. Nehemiah was building a Jerusalem and a temple and its inhabitants that are only the shadow of what we have. These are shadow of the things, but shadows of the things to come. And we as a church is the true Jerusalem and the true temple of God and the true people of God who has been redeemed by the Lord Jesus Christ. And shouldn't our affections be stronger than that of Nehemiah, who only had the shadow while we have the substance? So that is the call to us. There is a real crisis before us. Our church life has shrunk. Some of our people are vulnerable and God's worship is not as it's supposed to be. And perhaps there is still little that we can do about it, but we are being called to wait upon the Lord, to sustain our prayer, to sustain our hope, to sustain our faith, and to sustain even our grief and anguish until God has restored us. So would you, would you be like Nehemiah, who would not shake off his anguish, who would, who would not drown it, with comforts until something was done. Or perhaps the length of this pandemic time has already made your heart cold and unaffected to the things of God. I hope that that is not the case. We must persevere during these times. One of the men that was greatly used by God in history in our recent times was William Carey. He is in fact called the father of modern missions because his missionary work was a pattern. Uh, the missionary work he did uh, for, the, for, for uh, India, it was a pattern uh, for subsequent missionaries. And yet, how can we assess his work? and his character as someone who was used by God. This is what he said about him. He said that if, if any biographer would write about him, he would not be given enough credit unless it is these words. He said, I can plod, 
I can persevere in any definite pursuits. To this, I owe everything. Meaning, even during those times when there seems to be no fruits of conversion, there seems to be no churches planted in spite of his sacrifices, in spite of his prayers, in spite of his grief. He said he continued on plodding and persevering. And it was the kind of man and woman who can wait upon the Lord who would be useful to his kingdom. So embrace the cause of God, brethren, so wholeheartedly as to be able to persevere through long and even difficult years. Even difficult years of pandemic or whatever circumstances. So that is what we see in Nehemiah. There was patience in waiting, but there was also wisdom in action. So within four months of waiting, we saw that Nehemiah did not let his anguish die out. His anguish for Jerusalem remained intact. He was bringing it to the Lord. He was incubating it, to use my illustration, in the shelter of prayer. But his ceaseless prayer was accompanied by careful strategizing on what's to be done about this dire situation. He did not leave it out in prayer. He wanted to strategize to make an advance. Nehemiah, for example, we find wisdom in Nehemiah uh, when he waited for an opportune time to bring the matter to the Persian king. Meaning he did not bring the matter himself directly to the king. He was waiting for a time of opportunity when the king would perhaps be more friendly in order to receive a request from him. So we, we, uh, we, 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 uh, Nehemiah knew that Persian kings can be fickle-minded. Uh, you have that, for example, in uh, Esther, the, uh, the king Ahasuerus was, uh, was the one who uh, signed the decree to have the Jews annihilated, and then later on he was the one who, who uh, changed his mind. And this was true of the history of the Persian kings. Many of them were fickle-minded. So that means a, a wrong timing of approaching the king may end up actually worse for Jerusalem. Not for their good, but for their worse, for, 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 their, uh, for, for their harm. Artaxerxes, after all, the king during Nehemiah's time was the one who ordered that all rebuilding wo works in Jerusalem should cease. You can read that in Ezra chapter 4. In Ezra chapter 4, those kings beyond the river uh, uh, wrote a letter to King Artaxerxes and they were telling him that uh, the Jerusalem city is a rebellious city, uh, it is a wicked city, therefore it must not be allowed to continue its rebuilding work. And that is where the rebuilding work ceased in Ezra chapter 4. And it was signed. That, that, that policy to have that rebuilding work ceased was signed by, by Artaxerxes, the same king uh, in, in our passage. So that means Nehemiah's concern for Jerusalem when he is not wise about it in bringing it to the king may be mistaken as an act of disloyalty to Persia. So you want to build that Jerusalem, that city that is rebellious. Uh, so uh, Nehemiah wanted, waited for an opportune time. And when it, when it was now the king who initi initiated to ask Nehemiah about the cause of his sadness, uh, the, the king asked in chapter 2 verse 2, Why is your face sad? Nehemiah's response once again showed carefulness. And he affirmed his civic loyalty to Artaxerxes. He said in verse 3, Let the king live forever. And he also carefully worded his concern. And notice that he did not mention Jerusalem to the king. He mentioned a city in Judah, which he described as the place of my father's grave. In other words, Nehemiah was very careful to show that his concern is not political. There is no attempt to 
to, uh, there is no intention to, e- to, to initiate a rebellion against the Persian Empire. It is a personal concern. The place of my father's graves. So there is some kind of, uh, of a demonstration that this is a personal matter. And upon Artaxerxes' favor, we find that Nehemiah gave a thoughtful plan on how to carry about the rebuilding work in Jerusalem. In chapter 2, verses 7 to the following verses, he asked for a written authorization in order to bring with him, after all, he's going to pass through uh, those, uh, those places uh, that is called beyond the river, and it is in those places that, uh, that initially wrote to King Artaxerxes in order to have the rebuilding work cease. So he wanted to have a letter from the king himself. And then he asked the king to also write to a certain Asaph in order to have provisions uh, in order to complete his projects. So that means he asked for, uh, for supplies of timber and he secured that from the king. So in other words, he already had a plan in mind. He wanted to go about it in wisdom, in godly wisdom, because he wanted to see the rebuilding of Jerusalem according to its biblical vision of being the city exalted among the nations rather than trampled on and and blasphemed. What we can learn from that is a thoughtful vision executed with godly wisdom characterizes the man or woman to be used by God. So there must be a vision and there must be wisdom, godly wisdom in order to get through that vision. Nehemiah saw the ruins of his city but he embraced the biblical vision of what God has promised to Jerusalem. This is not what Jerusalem is supposed to be. It's supposed to be a city that's exalted among the nations. It's, it is supposed to be a city that is the very beacon of God's salvation. And yet now it is lying in ruins. And therefore, Nehemiah set his gaze towards, towards working on uh, to that vision of God for Jerusalem. On, and on the basis of the, this, Nehemiah acted with wisdom in order to see the work of re- rebuilding this fallen city. God has a vision for that city. Nehemiah embraced that vision. And that vision, the story sees Jerusalem exalted among the nations where God is glorified and Nehemiah placed himself within this story and he strategized a move forward to advance this vision's fulfillment. That is somewhat similar to what we read in Romans 15. Because in Romans 15, the Apostle Paul was quoting those biblical promises in the Old Testament that one day the Gentiles will come come to salvation, that one day the Gentiles are going to come to the spiritual Jerusalem and they will be united together under a one Davidic king and that king is Jesus Christ. For example, in chapter 15 verse 9, we read that uh, the, the Apostle Paul quoting the the, the biblical vision that the root of Jesse will come and he will arise to rule the Gentiles. This is God's vision that his Davidic king would not be a localized king in that geography of Jerusalem in Palestine, but he is going to be king of all the nations, even the Gentiles. And Paul, knowing that vision, set his gaze towards fulfilling it. He did not say, well, God is sovereign. He's going to accomplish all of that. So I'm just going to to slumber here with my hands folded. No, he worked in order. He worked 
hard in facts in order to see that vision into fruition. This is what drove him to strategize his missionary endeavors with the Roman Christians. That is what this letter is about. He is telling the Roman Christians, this is the vision. This is the vision, the Gentiles coming to the Savior, Jesus Christ. This is not true yet, but this is what God is working on. And therefore, let's join. And that's what Paul is doing. He is seeking the, the Roman church to join in the vision to see the Gentiles come to Christ and to support him for his missionary endeavor. And so he said, he stated very clearly, this, I, thus, therefore, because we have this biblical vision, this is what God is doing. He's bringing Gentiles under the Lordship of Christ. Therefore, Paul said, I make it my ambition to preach the gospel, not where Christ has already been named. This is therefore what I'm setting my eyes upon. I want to see the biblical vision fulfilled that the Gentiles will come under the Lordship of Christ and therefore it has become my mission in life to advance the name of Christ wherever His name is not yet heard. And Roman believers, come, join me into fulfilling this vision. That is what the book of Romans is intended to be in facts. And that is what's be, what is supposed to be our calling as well, brethren. There is a biblical vision for the church. And that's what we are supposed to be working on. There are two bricklayers. I think I already told you this story. There are two bricklayers. And... Uh, uh, one observer saw that these two bricklayers are actually working uh, in different ways. One bricklayer was working in quite an unmotivated and lethargic manner. So he was placing one brick to the other, then one brick to the other. And then he observed another bricklayer who was very enthusiastic and he was excitedly doing the bricklaying job. And so he came to the first one and asked, What are you doing? So he said, I'm laying bricks. I'm putting one brick on the top of another, and then later another on the top of the other. And then he asked the other one, What are you doing? And the other one responded, I'm building a cathedral. So in other words, he saw the vision. He was not unmotivated, even though he, he had such a small part to play in it. And yet, he saw that what's, what he is doing is actually contributing to the building of the cathedral, of where, which is going to be a place of praise for God. That's what we are doing, brethren. We are building a cathedral. Not a physical cathedral, but a spiritual house where the cornerstone is Jesus Christ and we are the living stones. So let us then immerse ourselves with a biblical vision for spiritual Jerusalem, which is the church. That means we need to become more motivated, more motivated even than Nehemiah, because we have a greater vision. We are building not the shadow of the things that are to come, we are building the substance. Let me read from Revelation 21 in order to see God's vision for the church, what He is working on, what story He is fulfilling so that we may be invited to participate. Revelation 21, verse 1. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, 
For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them as their God. This is the biblical vision for the spiritual Jerusalem, and that is us. Therefore, we are being invited to play our part in this story by participating in an enthusiastic manner to building up the church of Jesus Christ. William Carey is someone we celebrate today because of his missionary endeavors which proved to be fruitful in the hand of God. But when he was young, he once spoke at, the, at a meeting of Baptist ministers speaking on the value of missions, overseas missions, and he was seeking to join the uh, leagues of Baptist churches then in order to go to foreign lands, in order to bring the gospel to those who are not yet, who are not yet saved, to those who have not yet heard of Christ. So he's, uh, he, he spoke uh, uh, passionately to them from uh, the Word of God, in fact, uttering before them that great uh, message we now remember today expects great things from God, attempts great things for God. But an older minister rebuked him and said, Young man, sit down. You are an enthusiast. When God pleases to convert the heathen, He'll do it without consulting you or me. In other words, this man has hid himself. He has hidden himself under the, uh, under the, uh, the presumption on God's sovereignty that he thinks it should promote passivity. If God's going to convert them, God will do that without you and me. And that's true. This man was right. But what he is not seeing is that God is inviting us to play a part in this story of redemption. And so, let us embrace that, brethren. Perhaps some of you here are still not part of this spiritual Jerusalem, you are outside. You are a pagan in that sense. Then I invite you to join in. The spiritual Jerusalem is open to all those who would submit themselves to that King, to King Jesus Christ, who would pledge their allegiance to Him and embrace Him as their Lord and as their Savior, as their Redeemer from sins, and as their Lord to serve with all of their lives. Friend, if you are not a Christian, then this is an invitation being extended to you to come to Him in faith, to embrace Him in faith, and to surrender to Him in repentance. I hope that you would join in this story. This story because this is the true story of the world. The story of Jesus Christ. So brethren, we have a spiritual Jerusalem to build and the vision is cast vividly upon our eyes. A glorious spiritual Jerusalem, holy, blameless, and a Jerusalem on which God is dwelling. 
Jerusalem presented to Christ as a bride without blemish. This is the vision and this is what we must be working on. So let us pray earnestly and let us plod perseveringly for the glory of God. Let us come to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious God, we thank you for these words that remind us and even invite us to indeed partake of that story of redemption, to embrace it as our as the very story that we inhabit, to live out our daily lives for the service of it, for the service of your glory, for the service of your cause and your purposes. So you so we pray that you would make us indeed men and women who would embrace this call and who would shake off our indifference and be motivated by the by that grand vision that you are setting before us so that we may work perseveringly and so that we may pray earnestly to see this glorious work fulfilled for our blessings and for your glory. We pray for those who are still strangers to your grace that you would also let them come to the Lord Jesus Christ to embrace him as their Lord and Savior. May they be part of the true spiritual Jerusalem and join that vision and glorious hope upon the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. So we commit the blessings of these words to you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.